Today's episode of Wine and Dime is sponsored by Rooted Planning Group, a fee-only financial planning firm that believes life is about events, supported by your dollars and cents. And we want to help you achieve your goals. Hop on over to www.rootedpg.com to learn more about the services. Every week, it's my goal to share financial information that helps you in both your life and financial vineyard. We hope it takes you from your roots to the journey of your vines and the influences in the air that have helped craft your delicious life. Like wine, life and finances have different palettes that should be celebrated and not judged. Hello, podcast listeners. Amy Irvine here, and I am going to continue this series on Secure Act 2.0. So this is part two of my series. For those of you last week, if you missed it, go back and listen to part one, where we talked about uh, what's called required minimum distributions. This week, I'm going to be talking about provisions that were are effective this year in 2023. So effective in 2023, one that we are super excited about is what's called a Roth SEP and a Roth Simple IRA. Now, I say that I'm excited about it. This was announced at the end of 2022. So although it is in law, it is not in practice yet because we haven't had time to actually get this up and going. But in 2023, you can have a Roth SEP, which a SEP is a simplified employee pension plan for people that are self-employed typically. Now it could be also a small business, but typically we see these used for self-employed individuals and simple IRAs are often for small businesses as well. Well, that's what they're meant for is small businesses. In the past, we couldn't do a Roth provision in these types of accounts. So we're really excited for our clients to have this flexibility now. I sort of did a happy dance when I read that provision. Now we just need to figure out and the custodians need to figure out how to, you know, have that as an account type and implement that. But I think that this was a really important provision. And of course, from a taxpayer's perspective, yes, you don't get the tax deduction if you put the money in the Roth. But if you have listened to me in the past, you know that I like to have buckets of money. I like to have some pre-tax. I like to have some tax-free and I like to have some taxable money. For a lot of our clients, it's if they earn enough money, they can't make a direct Roth IRA contribution. And so this provision, if they're small businesses, will allow them to do that. So we're really excited excited about that. More to come on that for sure as the custodians uh, open uh, allow us to open accounts on that um, that line of savings. More cool news about the Roth IRA is the fact that um, employer contributions can in the future be made on the Roth side. Now, this only apply, applies to uh, matching and non-elective contributions, not profit sharing contributions. So if your employer has a match or what's called a non-elective contribution, or if you are an employer and you have those kinds of contributions, you will be able to elect to put that on the Roth side of the plan. Now, of course, that's you know different than it has been in the past as far as, you know, being tax free, but these contributions need to be 100% vested when contributing. No vesting schedule or forfeiture provisions can be applicable to that particular provision if you elect. Again, this is something that's in law, but it's not practiced yet simply because the regulation is so new. Plans haven't made been able to make that kind of amendment in any way, shape or form. Another big um, provision that was in the, the legislation was that you could move 529 money to a Roth IRA. Now, there are a whole slew of limitations on this. So don't get so excited when you hear this or too excited when you hear this. The money does need to go to the beneficiary, it appears. So if you have a 529 plan for your son or your daughter or your nephew, niece, whoever, grandchild, then the money it appears does need to 
go to them. Now, the 529 has to be open for at least 15 years. So this is one of those like stickler provisions. So a lot of people might not be able to take advantage of this right away. We are encouraging our clients, uh, we will be encouraging our clients throughout the course of the year to open up a 529 to get that clock ticking if they have young children or um, beneficiaries that they want to name. Beneficiaries will have to be some sort of have some sort of compensation uh, in order to make this transition to because there is limitations on how much can actually be moved over. So if, for example, the maximum Roth IRA contribution is 6,500, then um, they have to have some compensation and the limit would be 6,500. And the lifetime cap of that is 35,000. So if you have $50,000 in a 529 plan, you can't move $50,000 over to the beneficiary all in one year. Any contributions to the 529 in the past five years can't be moved. So again, it's older contributions that are actually going to apply. There are also some hardship distributions that have some big changes in this year. Um, There are so many hardship distribution changes. The top ones that I would mention is um, when when it comes, now let me back up for a quick second. Actually, let me pause here because you might, if you're sitting by the fire, listening to this podcast or driving, um, listening to this podcast, you may need to take a breath before I get into some of <laughs> these hardship distributions. Um, for those of you that are you know sitting on the edge of the sea, waiting for me to give a recommendation on where to to get your wine from in the future, I will take a pause here and say one of the wineries that we really liked, uh, I mentioned last time was Pudding River. Um, Pudding River uh, was one of the wineries that Brent and I went to. I mentioned in the last podcast, there's um, the Cuvée Blanc, there's Chardonnay, there's Saran, there's Malbec. But if you like port wine, also consider, um, if you're out on their website, consider that you might be interested in trying their port. It's a Syrah port style. And so very interesting wine. If you're looking for that, you know, winter sipper, uh, I would highly recommend that you go explore that. All right. So if you are sitting by a fireside listening to this podcast and you're sipping the port wine and you're, um, you're saying, okay, Amy, what were the what were the hardship distributions that you were mentioning? Uh, hardship distributions, just as a understanding of what they are, are something that you can take from your qualified retirement plan. So this is not something that you would take from uh, an IRA. This is something that you would take from a 401k as an example. So, or a profit sharing or a money purchase pension plan. This is something, again, that it's not every type of retirement account that's out there. It's a very specific provision and your plan has to have the, has to allow it into the plan. So it actually has to allow for hardship, um, yeah, it has to allow for a hardship withdrawal to be made. So starting in 2023, um, there are some additional hardship distribution rules that you can take. And more importantly, in 2024, many of them will be applicable. So one that happens to take place in 2020, I I guess that you would consider it a hardship distribution, but in 2023 would be the new terminal illness distribution rules. So if you, um, and, and it was interesting when I read through the regulations, the the rules behind terminal illness usually are within 24, 12 to 24 months. The language on a terminal illness distribution is that that does apply to both IRAs and employer plans. And the definition is up to seven years. And you can actually repay the distribution up to three years. So that was pretty interesting um, that they writ- they wrote that and that was effective this year. So pretty interesting rule around terminal illness. It was actually effective as of the date of the legislation. So technically in 2022. 
There were also some changes around uh, the 72T rules that were really interesting. Um, 72T allows you to take, it's sort of an exception to the 10% penalty. And one of the things that you needed to do was uh, aggregate your IRAs. And if I'm reading the interpretation correctly, you can actually segregate the IRAs in the future and be able to have sort of the um, one IRA give you that monthly or annual distribution until 59 and a half or five years, whichever is longer. And then if you have this other IRA, you might be able to take lump sums from there. Now, where is that important? Let's say you start taking 72T distributions at age 57. Well, if you start taking them at age 57, then you have to follow the five-year rule, right? Because that's the longer, so that's age 62. So you have to t- keep taking the same amount until age 62. If you can segregate the two IRA accounts, then technically, yes, from the IRA that you established the uh, 72T distribution, you have to keep taking that monthly distribution, but you have this other bucket over there that you'd be able to take money from without negating the 72 2T rule. So there's going to be some additional clarification on that. And um, I'll certainly report on that going forward. Um, another uh, interesting provision around effective provisions in 2023 is something called a qualified longevity annuity contract. Now, in the past, we were limited to $135,000. And what you can do is take $135,000 out of your retirement account and put it in this qualified longevity annuity. Now, qualified longevity annuity says, I'm going to push this money out until I'm older. And it's not, it, it sort of removes a chunk of money from your retirement accounts for RMD purposes. So it allows you to extend that um, money out to a, an older age. And then, and then if you live that long, you start taking distributions at that point in time. It's sort of meant to be an inflationary protection vehicle as well. Well, they increase that amount to $200,000. Now we're going to be looking at this for our clients that have large 401k balances because, um, you know, it may be advantageous to take a chunk like that and push it out to, uh, to push it into a qualified longevity annuity contract just to give you some, uh, as, as I mentioned, inflation protection later in your retirement years. Uh, and then I would say that I, I, I want to say it's a nugget, um, is the military spouse eligibility credit that also was effective in 2023. Uh, for those of you that were in the military or have family members in the military, this was meant to, because as you know, if, if you're married to somebody in the military, you're basically in the military as well. And, um, you know, that means that the job opportunities and some of the changes that you make in your life are, it's hard to, you know, stay in one place at any given time. Well, for employers with greater than 100 employees, this new credit could, if you ele- if the employer elects to adopt it, could credit um, non, what's called non highly compensated employees, spouses, military spouses, could give them credit for adopting provisions to allow them to be eligible to participate within two months instead of, you know, if your plan says they have to be there a year or six months or something like that. If you as an employer have a provision for these non-highly compensated military spouses, you can get a credit for allowing eligibility earlier. So eligibility for participation within two months. Um, They would be treated as though they have had two years of service upon participation. So again, if there's any kind of vesting provision, you just gain two years of service in the plan and you may be eligible for some employer contributions. The other um, provision in order to get the credit is that they must be immediately invested, immediately vested in employer contributions. This could be um, up to three years per eligible spouse that the credit is available, and it's actually 200 per eligible spouse. So you as an employer could get $200 per eligible spouse plus dollar for dollar up to $300 in employer contributions for the credit. So looking at, you know, possible credit of $500 per spouse, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot if you're going to put those provisions in. But, you know, if you are, if you are in a state or in a location where you're hiring a lot of military spouses and it's that sort of transient turnover, this could be very beneficial to you and to the military spouses. 
So that is part two of the Secure Act 2.0. Those are the provisions that are effective for 2023. Stay tuned for part three, where I walk through the provisions that are effective in 2024. I want to thank you for listening to the show today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love it if you share with your friends and rate us on iTunes so that more people can find us. And we hope that you have a great evening, a great morning, great afternoon, no matter what time of the day it is for you. And that will about do it for today's episode of Wine and Dime. You can contact Amy through the website, www.rootedpg.com or amy at rootedpg.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at RootedPG for the latest news. And if you have any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear about, feel free to let us know. And don't forget to rate and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next time.